Uh, hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, so today we're going to talk about ethnicity and uh, DNA. Um, just a short disclaimer, uh, neither I nor Lewis have any background, formal background in genomics uh, or bioinformatics. Um, so what we want to do today is sort of um, try and convey how um, approachable it is to um, do DNA analysis for ethnicity with a background that all of you probably already have with um, basic and very well-known uh, packages like uh, Pandas and Scikit-learn and NumPy. And uh, yeah, so when I first got to my heritage um, to the science department, actually I didn't know anything about genomics as I just said. Um, and one of the things that were what I was very pleased with is that when I tried to search things about it and how people actually um, try to understand ethnicity um, was that they've done it, a lot of people do it um, through PCA for very um, basic understanding of that. And that kind of made me calmer because I knew PCA and I was sort of like, okay, I can get to it. I have no idea what is the connection between DNA data and the ethnicity and how the PCA relates to it. But that kind of made make me more uh, calm about it. Um, so uh, Lewis is going to talk a bit more about my heritage and uh, PCA itself. And then I'm going to explain a bit about um, our DNA data and how to actually do it in Python. So, um, yes, yeah, so like in this talk, it will be like broadly like in three parts. In the first one, we'll be giving like a really brief introduction to PCA and why it might have anything to do with ethnicity. Uh, and then um, Daniel will, will talk more about um, like DNA data and how um, it actually becomes sort of like, a, you know, NumPy matrices. And in the third part, he will talk in a, in a lot more detail about like some, uh, some like nuance and how to, how to do this analysis. So before we start, let's talk briefly about my heritage. So my heritage is uh, at its core a uh, genealogy company, which means that it's really, it helps uh, people like save information about their family tree and like find more information about their family, find relatives, find documents, and so on. And uh, since sort of like your family history like likely is like very highly correlated with your DNA, um, about a year and a half ago, my heritage started doing DNA tests. So that's when like the science team uh, of which we're a part was formed, and the science team is doing several things. One of them is the ethnicity uh, estimates. So uh, if you buy the kit and you do the exam, you might get like a result uh, like this, which just tells you sort of like for each of the supported ethnicities, like which percentage of which one you are. And uh, there's also uh, work around like relative matching and some um, other like longer term research. So that's like a brief overview of like, what the science team is doing. So um, let's get uh, down to business. So we'll start by uh, having like a really brief recap of uh, what PCA is. So the, the problem setup is the following, is that we have a data matrix of uh, n examples by p features, right? So you can think of sort of like in our context, like n individuals and like p, like genetic positions or something. And um, we would like to project the, this uh, data down into like a lower dimensional data set. So uh, one of the reasons to do that is that uh, maybe you want to like to visualize the data in like in, uh, one, two or like three dimensions. Another reason is that there might be a lot of uh, correlations or redundancy or like noise in the data and uh, you'd like to train um, your, uh, your algorithms on, on a more like reduced uh, like data set. So, uh, and like, sort of like naturally, like we would like to do this like projection into like P dimensions where P is less than, uh, oh, sorry, into K dimensions where K is less than P while preserving as much information as possible. And uh, preserving like information, like uh, in this context, essentially one of the ways to think about it is in terms of reconstruction error. So uh, there's like a few different like equivalent ways to formulate it. Like I think in this context, it's more useful to think about it in terms of reconstruction error. So what it means is that like you project it down into k dimensions, and if you were to project it like back into the original feature set, uh, it is sort of like as accurate as possible. And the uh, PCA, like in a nutshell is the best solution for that among uh, linear transformations, right? So uh, it will find essentially like a matrix V such that when you multiply your data matrix X by V, you have this like matrix which is uh, N by K, right? So like, so we do a linear transformation of the data and uh, into, into the K dimensions that, um, that we want. So that's PC in a nutshell. Uh, I'm going to skip the rest and like maybe we'll go back to it if we have time at the end of the talk and we'll start talking about genetics. So um, like before, like w why would like genetic data like have anything to do with um, like with PCA and ethnicity? So uh, like I think like one way to think about it is that, you know, for like thousands of years, like people have been uh, like mating 
And uh, like until like fairly recently, where people started to move more, you know, like sort of like you know hundreds of years ago, like uh, uh, companies did not offer such uh, uh, generous like relocation packages. So people were mostly like uh, staying around like the same areas and the same village or in the same shtetl or whatever, and maybe like mating with like people from like nearby cities and so on. So uh, there are all these uh, like really like huge correlations uh, in our data, depending like on where uh, on where you come from. And uh, we would like to, like to project it down into like a few dimensions to remove sort of like all this uh, redundancy. And uh, so like the problem setup, just to be a bit more formal, is that like we have again a matrix X. So we have n individuals, and we have p rows, right? So uh, so p might be here like p sort of like genetic positions, and um, uh, and we also know the location. Uh, of origin of each individual, like with pretty high confidence in this particular setup. So, like, let's say that we know that uh, you know, like, the individual in row you know ten has been in like Finland for a very long time. Uh, so, the um, the problem, his family has been in Finland for a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, maybe like we know that they're like a very small town, uh, which means that they probably haven't like moved for for a while. So uh, the, what we'll do is the following: is that we'll use like PCA to project this data down, and ignoring some like uh, a lot of like processing, which is important that I know talk more about. But we'll project the data down into two dimensions, and we'll color the these like the, the data points according to their country of origin. When um, like w when I was thinking about it, like I, I was like quite surprised actually. I thought that like maybe there would be like some correlation between you know the true ethnicity and um, and like and the PCs, but uh, the result is that it actually it looks something like this. So uh, sort of like the x-axis here is like PC2, and the y-axis is PC1, uh, and this is like a very highly cited paper in uh, in genetics. And uh, the colors are the country. So like this is like a, I found it like quite magical when I first uh, saw it. And uh, what it shows is sort of like the PCs, just like without any knowledge of like ethnicity, when you just color them it really closely resembles the map of Europe, right? So like uh, you guys can see sort of like, um, it's a bit hard to read the legends, but uh, on the lower left, you see sort of like the Portugal and Spain, uh, in the top uh, right, in, in the top, like you see like the Scandinavian countries and so on. So like, and uh, and again, like this, like when you do this, like on a, like a smaller scale as well, like so this is uh, among like Switzerland and the neighboring countries. Uh, you see this, like, even, like, within Switzerland, it's able to distinguish between the like, different parts of the country. So, like, uh, you see the distinction between, like, the, you know, the German-speaking, like, part of Switzerland, the Italian-speaking, and so on. So, it's quite, um, and it's, it's quite impressive. So, uh, the point here is that, like, PCA has uh, a lot to do with ethnicity, and uh, it's typically, like, sort of, like, a, maybe, like, a first um, step that, like, someone will take in, like, understanding ethnicity given DNA data. And, um, yeah, and then I will tell you guys more about uh, like how to like some more details about how to actually do this. Um, so just one more comment about um, general ethnicity estimations. If in, if you don't care about um, ethnicity as a label as a thing, um, usually in genomics it is one of the first things that you do in an analysis to understand to understand any trait uh, because it's a very important covariate of. Um, uh, to, that will be useful uh, in every analysis that will impact your results. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so uh, going back to essentially what we have, um, each person has uh, DNA which encompasses all uh, of its genetic uh, information, and it's in the, each one of us have 23 pairs of uh, chromosomes which has that data. Um, one you get from your mother, one you get from your father, and um, yeah. So this is what the data will actually translate uh, when you see such data uh, after it comes from the lab. So you, for each person, you would get um, a few. We would get a few um, hundred thousands of rows, and each row um, is basically a feature. And in our language, it will be called a SNP. And each SNP has two values, one that you get from your mother, one from your father, and they are called alleles. And at each point, each allele can have one of two values, okay? So it can be uh, at some point maybe an A or a C, maybe two A's, maybe two C's, 
And uh, what we call those values, okay, these alleles, you usually have the most common alleles, which will be called the reference allele, or you have um, an allele which is least common, which is the alternative allele. So the way we can represent the data is just by counting the amount of reference allele or alternatives allele you have at each spot. Um, so you can have zero reference alleles, you can have one reference allele, or you can have two, okay? Um, so, yeah, just a general point. Um, uh, we only have, we only need uh, a few hundred thousand rows because 99% of our uh, DNA is the same for uh, all human beings. So um, the SNP data is actually the part that varies uh, between people. So that will capture the um, variability that will help us understand the ethnicity or a trait of a certain uh, person. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So how do we actually get the DNA data? So um, MyHeritage actually uh, markets DNA kits for ethnicity analysis or matching. Um, so each person that orders a kit um, gets a, a swab. It then scrapes the inside of their cheeks um, to get the cells which then is transported into a lab uh, where they actually extract the, um, the, the biological data and kind of transform it for us um, for something that we can understand like uh, that will eventually become a NumPy array. Yeah. Sorry. So as I said before, for each row we uh, get the um, uh, the alleles themselves. So it's basically just two letters. Um, then we count the uh, appearances of the reference allele or the alternative alleles, and we get um, at the end uh, NumPy array, which is basically just a list of um, zero, ones, and twos for each person. So let's see how we actually can do that. Uh, so this is not going to be a live demo since uh, I was too scared to do one. But you have a notebook here so you can actually see um, how things are being done and uh, see that you all basically have most of the tools that you need to actually do this analysis yourself. Um, so we start by importing the libraries. So you can see here that you probably know most of them. Um, we have Pickle so I can uh, load in the data that I've already saved and pre-processed uh, from the ACs, Ts and Gs into a NumPy array and um, also the metadata. And the rest of the packages, again, are pretty, pretty familiar for most of you probably. Um, this is, these are uh, sklearn functions, uh, pandas, so we can save the, uh, the metadata as a data frame, uh, NumPy, so we can deal with uh, some uh, linear algebra, and then some uh, functions for plotting from matplotlib and seaborn, and also um, a few functions from uh, scikit-learn so we can later classify um, the things that we get in our PCA. The only package that you probably don't know here if, you're, if you don't deal with bioinformatics uh, in Python is a package called um, scikit-alil, uh, which we import here. Um, a lot of its functionalities you can actually um, get from using other more standard tooling, but it's um, sometimes a bit more convenient. Um, because our point here is um, that you can do all this stuff yourself with the knowledge that you already have, we try to do most of it in standard libraries, uh, but sometimes we will use the scikit one. Uh, yeah, so first we load in data, which I kind of uh, prepared uh, in advance, and our structure of the data will be um, 22,000 chromosomes, okay, so that's 22,000 features uh, for about 23,000 people, and then we have a data frame uh, uh, which corresponds to the number of people we have. Um, so this is just a subset I took yesterday, so uh, we can have some data to play with, not too much. Uh, so we can, uh, so I could have iterated quickly over it. And here you can see what the um, DNA data looks like when we have it here, just as I told you before, just zero ones and twos. So um, every row here corresponds to a uh, to a person, and every um, column is a SNP. And you can see the values are just zero ones and twos. Those are numbers. You can easily do any um, linear algebra you want to do over it. Uh, okay. So, um, as any analysis, you would probably begin with um, splitting your data into training and test set because you want to learn over it and see how well, um, uh, how well you're doing. Uh, so here I just split our data into training and test. Um, again, standard use of uh, NumPy and Pandas and stuff like that. I just iterate over our different uh, populations that we have so I can decide how many samples I want for the training and the testing of it. Um, so I just picked up around two, um, 20 people for our testing set and uh, 200 for the um, uh, training set, just for this example. 
And so after the nice introduction that we have for PCA, let's see how we actually do that um, without even thinking too much about the math behind it. Um, okay, so I just, um, these are just a few wrapper functions to help us. So the first one is just removing SNPs which have zero variance in it. Um, I know before I said that the variables that we have are supposed to be varying in the population because it's like the 1% that is supposed to uh, indicate the difference between us. But since we only use a sample and not the entire population, um, then sometimes it could be the case that for certain SNPs, for certain features, uh, we'll have zero variability. We'd like to remove that before moving into PCA. Um, then we just have a, sorry, you can ignore the first uh, do PCA function because that was not well uh, written for uh, doing also testing on it. <laughs> so um, we have the do PCA function here. Uh, which is just a wrapper for scikit-learn standard um, PCA. We first uh, create a scalar option, uh, fit the scaling to our data, um, put it in the PCA. We only save two features uh, because this is just an example. We want to show you even in two dimensions um, and do a classification over it that it is very uh, useful and powerful even without um, a lot of features. Um, yeah, save it uh, in a data frame, the final pieces in the data frame with the labeling so we can plot it out easily. Um, and then also transfer the scalar and PCA object for the testing set. And uh, here we also have, uh, sorry, here also have just a wrapper um, around uh, Seaborn um, for plotting out the scatter plot. Um, it will be just uh, the first species over the second species, and we we'll color it by the population labels that we have. Okay. Um, so here I just picked up a uh, few uh, populations that I wanted to use in this analysis. So you have um, people from uh, Balkan descent, uh, Ashkenazi Jews, uh, Finnish West Russian, and uh, people of uh, Irish, uh, Welsh, or Scottish descent. Uh, I know the uh, name of our talk was uh, three types of Jews, but uh, due to time constraints, and uh, we picked up the most boring Jew that we can find and put it here with a few Europeans. Uh, yeah, so uh, again, we just save our um, training set and, um, I'm sorry, we just filter our training set um, uh, to have the people from those population do the same for the testing set. And then here at the end, we just go, uh, this is what you get, okay? So we just use the functions that, we that we've written before. Um, again, it was just standard um, sklearn and just plotting out the results. And you can see we have uh, quite a good distinction uh, between the populations here. Um, it's not a perfect distinction, uh, but remember you've just entered DNA data into PCA and you actually got something without any real pre-processing, so I think that's kind of good. Um, and what you uh, have here is, um, you can see that the first species kind of um, decides whether you're an Ashkenazi Jew or not. You can see this is uh, most of what you see along the x-axis. Um, but you also have a pretty good um, distinguish for the uh, Finnish West Russian population. Um, so again, w with most of the standard tooling that you have, that most of you have, and um, you can think of a lot of things you can do to improve um, that uh, classification, to improve that clustering. Uh, but right now I want to talk about something that is more specific to, um, to genomic analysis, um, just to... Uh, tell you a bit more about genomics and that there are some things that uh, you can do with the domain knowledge if you have it. Um, so one very um, distinctive feature of, um, of DNA data is called linkage disequilibrium. Um, I have the formal definition here, but as I said, I'm not a uh, formally trained as a geneticist, so I just uh, leave the uh, formal definition here and I'll try to explain it just in, um, in a way that I think most of you will probably get it uh, fairly easily. So uh, linkage disequilibrium basically means that at each point, each SNP is very much correlated to the SNPs that are around it um, uh, physically, okay? So if we um, give the data to the PCA, it will likely um, to cluster just um, things that are related to those clusters of correlations that are very much specific to the DNA of each, to, uh, to just the, the, this DNA feature. And if we want to plot it out and see what those correlations look like, uh, this is what it actually looks like. Okay, 
So um, both the y-axis and the axis are the SNPs, and um, these is this is just a correlation. So you can see there's a very high blocks of high correlation there, and we would like to remove it so we can sort of help the PCA do a better job of understanding just the, um, the general ethnicity of the person from that and not capture the, those blocks of correlations within that data. Um, okay, so in order to understand that and see that uh, plot to understand the data and that we have this feature inside our data of the correlation, um, we just use a simple uh, NumPy function the, to get the, the correlation here, np.correat, and then you just use Seaborn to uh, see that data. And I also left out the way to do it inside Scikit-Alil, so you can see that it's also pretty, um, pretty easy and also see that even if you see um, packages that have very distinctive bioinformatics tooling, it, can, it probably corresponds to a lot of things that you already know. So this is just uh, one example of it. Um, and then we want to remove the, those SNPs, those features that are in correlation to one another. So we uh, create another function which is called ldprune. Um, and we just, uh, it's a very slight wrapper to a scikit function called locate unlinked. So which basically just means locate the uh, SNPs, the features which are not linked, which do not correlate which is with each other. And um, so you can see here it's just one row. The rest of the rows is just for us to know uh, what, uh, what's the amount of features that we ended up with. Um, here you can see the, that we did a pretty good job. Um, there are no more blocks of correlated data. And uh, in the top here, you can see um, how it's been done. Uh, just uh, uh, one line to remove it. And you can see that we started out with about 22,000 features, and we're actually left with about um, 6,000 features. OK? So uh, let's see now if we've actually done a good job at uh, creating the PCA to be a bit more understandable and uh, see if the cluster separate a bit more nicely. I will first run the PCA again um, with all the data so we can compare uh, the two plots and see if they actually improve. So uh, this is the first plot. It's again just doing the PCA uh, without uh, removing the linked uh, SNP, without removing the correlated features. And this is what it looks like after. Um, again, it's not, a, it's not a perfect separation. But you can see that um, the cluster are a bit more removed now, the uh, Ashkenazi Jewish cluster and the Finnish West Russian cluster, and the um, Irish and, um, sorry, yeah, the Irish and uh, Finnish ones, the, the ones you see in the middle, which used to be a, uh, a bit more overlapping, uh, you can see now that they kind of have a different, um, they kind of have a different density to them and you can, uh, not obviously not separate them perfectly, but if you classify over it, you will obviously um, be above random. So, um, just so we can see what we can have just with this very much straightforward analysis of just doing PCA and using only one thing that we know about um, that we know about uh, DNA, which is linkage to equilibrium. Let's see how we're doing with the classification. Um, so first I've done the classification without the removal of, of LD and we can see that we have like a precision of 80% and a recall of 76 and again I think this is pretty good results for having just taken raw data in, do a PCA without even thinking about it and or with only the first two principal components and getting results. Oh yeah and it's also just chromosome 22, again we wanted to use not a lot of data, uh, obviously if you use more data that would help but this is just chromosome 22 with um, 22,000 SNPs. And let's see how this classification is doing when we use only the uh, 6,000 unlinked um, SNPs. And surprise, surprise, you can see that it's doing better. Um, we've upped our uh, recall by 10% and uh, precision by 8%. Um, and again, this is just standard classification. I just used, S literally just went to SVM, learned SVM, copied whatever was in there, and actually got pretty good results. And a lot of the time the case in genomic analysis um, is, again, you, you don't necessarily care about the ethnicity specifically as the trait itself, uh, but you want to do something quick to understand it so you can use it as a covariate. 
So even if you just use uh, this type of things, it's, it's very helpful as a part of your analysis. Um, and of course, you can use all of the of, all of your experience um, using and um, dealing with machine learning problems to understand this better and to create better features and uh, make the accuracy better. Um, okay, so here we kind of have semi-balanced classes, but of, of course, this this is not always the case. Um, the way that you would deal with it uh, is probably very similar to the ways you deal with imbalanced classes wherever you work. Um, same with outlier removal. Um, I'll only say one thing about the outlier removal in our case, um, which is that sometimes uh, our labeling, with, which is actually geographical labeling, is not accurate to the um, um, what we want to capture. For example, uh, Ashkenazi Jews, uh, some may come from Poland, but that does not mean they're of Polish descent. So sometimes, uh, in our cases, we would not like to remove those people. We would actually use, um, we would actually relabel them as Ashkenazi Jews based only on the DNA data that we have. Um, another thing that is um, very specific to genetic data is that sometimes in your analysis you have people from the same families, and you would like to remove them for this type of analysis just because the PCA is likely to capture um, more of the signal in the families rather than the signal of their uh, generic uh, or their general ethnicity. Because of the way that the, of the population structure works, the family signal is much higher. Uh, but yeah, so this is just a very basic example of how to go very straightforward into ethnic, and ethnic analysis uh, with uh, Python and uh, with standard tooling. I'll uh, let uh, Luis talk a bit more about uh, some more advanced stuff of PCA. So, uh, so yeah. So, like, first, a uh, couple of things that I forgot to mention. Like, one is that like Daniel has been sort of on like from like ground zero on uh, in my heritage, working on the ethnicity algorithm, which is uh, which is in production. So he's been there like from, like from the very beginning until like now working on improving it. And the second thing is that just to clarify that this is not um, it, this does not have like much to do with what's actually in production. This is mostly like an intro to show like how to do like ethnicity analysis like really quickly like yeah, if uh, like if you have to. Uh, so like uh, I just wanted like to wrap up with like a couple of um, like other notes if you're that might be of interest if you're doing like you say um, analysis. So um, we'll go through it like kind of quickly because we're almost out of time. Uh, so like one thing is that sort of like after you do uh, like the way that PCA works like one of the ways that you can think about it um, is that the, um, you can compute the correlation matrix of the data and um, its eigenvalues will be proportional to like the variance explained by uh, their respective components um, and um, so just to give you like a couple of examples um, so like for example if you have like a matrix of random values, right? Like there is no like structure at all to it. Each entry, is, let's say, it's like a Gaussian, uh, and you have like a lot more rows than features. Then most of the eigenvalues will be like around one. So this is basically saying that they don't have much, uh, like there there isn't like much like there. It's like explain like uh, much more between one and the other because like, the data is all random. And uh, differently, if you have um, some actual like low dimensional structure in the data then some eigenvalues, they may pop out of the distribution, uh, meaning that uh, there is actually something explained. So like your eigenvalue distribution might look something like that. that this is a matrix with different shape. So you can see that like most of them are sort of like, you know, less than five. And then you have like a few which are like, are popping out of the distribution. I know it's a bit hard to see, but um, there's like something like three or four eigenvalues that are popping out. So um, if uh, like, I don't know, if this is something that interests you, like we also um, like, as other pointers, we want to suggest like to look into like like these like two things. Like one is called the Merchenko Pasteur distribution, which uh, we've been using like to make sure that like we have like removed like LD from the data, for example. Uh, so the Merchenko Pasteur distribution basically tells you like that given uh, some asymptotic shape of the data, depending on like the number of rows and the number of features, if the data is actually like random without low dimensional structure it tells you what the distribution of the eigenvalues will be. So like the red line, that's the theoretical distribution, and the blue is the empirical eigenvalues in the randomly generated matrix. And another like uh, very related literature has to do with like the spike model. Uh, so the spike model basically means that like you have like a random matrix and you're adding some like, let's say like a one uh, rank one, um, like bias to the, um, to the correlation matrix. 
then it tells you sort of like how strong your signal has to be for it to pop out of the Marchenko Pasteur distribution. So here, like we have like a random matrix that has like some low dimensional structure, and then you have like some eigenvalues which are like popping out of it. And um, in the case of ethnicity, like if you want to make sure that like you have actually like removed LD, uh, one of the ways to check that is like it's not sort of like exactly matching like the theoretical literature because the assumptions on the distributions are different. But you can check that you only have like very few eigenvalues which are popping out of the Merchenko Pasteur distribution. Uh, and this is, I think, relevant for other applications as well. So uh, I know we hope that this um, this was like uh, useful for you guys. Uh, if uh, if you want to like play around with data, like we have these uh, like resources which are uh, which are open, you can try to get a hold of them. Uh, and if the, this really interests you as well, like uh, we're hiring, like you should you should be in touch with us. And then that's all. Thanks.